Well, good morning all. Uh, it's Trevor Ronzi here, CEO of ARAMA. I just want to um, thank you for connecting. This is the first uh, webinar for ARAMA. So uh, those of you who know me will be used to the fact that you've got my cheery face looking out across the room. Uh, but he here today is Lynn and I. And uh, so Lynn's gotten over her initial morning shock uh, of seeing me in the morning and uh, she's so far recovered. So I want to say thank you for dialing in. Thank you for taking a step into the new era of uh, technology for ARAMA. It's a big step for ARAMA to deliver webinars in a digital sense. So uh, great, we're all on board. Uh, naturally, uh, we really appreciate ARAMA's, uh, the support from ARAMA members. Uh, without that, there's no point of ARAMA being around if we don't have members, of course. Uh, but we also do appreciate the support from our industry partners, and we've got a slide up there just to remind you of who they are. Just a special mention for EBM, who are celebrating 10 years of partnership with ARAMA this year. So we're very grateful to EBM. And of course, we have a number of ARAMA supporters who provide uh, ARAMA with a great deal of support, including helping us to sign up new members. So um, that's our uh, unashamed plug for our sponsors and supporters. Thank you for dialing in. And I'd now like to introduce Lynn. For those of you who don't know Lynn, uh, Lynn is the Senior Community Education Officer with the Residential Tenancies Authority. And she's here today to talk about the tenancy rules that you need to know as a manager who handle residential tenancies. Lynn's been at the RTA for 133, oh, so sorry, 13 <laughs> years, and has a vast uh, level of knowledge having worked within the rental sector for over 30 years. There you go. So uh, I, I refer to Lynn as the guru of Queensland tenancy laws. We're very happy to have her present today for today's session. Uh, let's face it, tenancy rules are not an exciting topic, um, but one that we must know if we're dealing with landlords and tenants. The way in which we're going to do this is Lynn's going to launch into a presentation which will feature some slides up on the screen for you. Uh, this is all being recorded, so you will be able to refer to this later, but we anticipate that the presentation will go for about 20 to 30 minutes and uh, there's an opportunity for you to ask questions online. So if you have a question at any stage, uh, type it in. I think there's a typing area, a box on your screen uh, for you to type in questions and we'll see those. And Lynn, I'm not sure whether you want to answer those questions as they pop up or leave them till the end. We'll see how we go. Absolutely. But um, certainly we'll, I'll talk to you again in around about 20, 30 minutes. So no over to you, Lynn. Good luck. Great. Thank you, Trevor. Okay, so for today's session, we're going to be talking about the RTA services, um, the Act, the Residential Tenancies and Roomy Accommodation Act 2008, resolving tenancy disputes. We're going to talk about compliance, which is involving our investigations area, and also questions and answer. And throughout the session, we will look at answering some of the questions um, that members have submitted. So what does the RTA do? Our core business is to administer the Residential Tenancies and Roomy Accommodation Act 2008 and the regulations. We do that by providing tenancy information to all parties involved in a tenancy. We have bond management, dispute resolution, investigations and prosecutions, and we also provide policy and education services as well. Who do we help? We help tenants and residents, lessors or landlords, agents, and that includes yourself, um, peak industry bodies, community sector groups, and other government agencies. So to give you a bit of an outline in relation to the RTA services, our contact centre is our 1300 366 311 number. And what we do is we provide personalised service um, via telephone or email to people inquiring about tenancy rules or the tenancy processes. Um, to give you an idea, our call centre on average gets around 1,800 calls per day. We also have um, bond management where you can actually lodge and refund bonds online or submit that to um, the RTA by post. We recommend that if you are going into management rights that you also register for e-services. That way then you can actually have a look on all the bonds that you have listed under your management um, and be able to manage a few things under the e-services. So please do that. If you're not sure on how to register for e-services, again, contact our call centre and they can step you through the process for that. 
In relation to a rental bond, the legislation is very clear under section 116 that you do have to pay it to the RTA and that there is actually penalty of provisions attached to this by not um, lodging a bond or late lodgement. So you need to fill in a lodgement form um, and submit that to the RTA. You need to do that and lodge the bond within 10 days of receiving the bond. And that's not business days, that is a flat 10 days. So best business practice out there in the sector would be that you choose one day a week where you can actually submit the bonds um, through to the RTA. Um, your trust account systems should be able to actually lodge those bonds through or disperse those bonds um, on a weekly basis as well. The maximum you can charge for a bond um, is, if it is under $700 per week, it's four times the weekly rental amount. And if it's over $700 a week, it is negotiable in relation to what you may charge. For the RTA, we also have our free dispute resolution service available to assist landlords and tenants uh, resolve their tenancy and bond disputes. And I will actually be talking a little bit more about our dispute resolution service later. We also have our investigations. So investigations area looks into the breaches of the Act that carry penalty provisions for non-compliance of the Act. And our Act has about 568 sections of the Act and about 125 of those sections have penalty provisions attached. The previous slide that I had up, you would see that it was a maximum penalty use points of 40 penalty units for not lodging the bond with the RTA. Um, so this is what our investigations area looks into. We also have a policy and stakeholder engagement unit. Um, our website, you can order forms, publications and a whole pile of other resources are available on our website. Just to give you an idea on the rental sector, so 34.2% of the properties across Queensland are rented. 71.1% of those properties are in South East Queensland. And 96.7% of the properties are either houses, flats or townhouses or units. Um, so to give you an idea, the balance to make it up to 100% would be deemed to be like roomy accommodation, so like purpose-built student accommodation and boarding houses, and also movable dwellings, the permanent rents in caravan parks. Thirty percent or more of the household income is spent on rent for approximately nearly 13% of households. 42% of all households renting are privately, are actually families. And the fastest growing age group of tenants is the aged 55 plus. The median or the average length of tenancy is 13.7 months and 43% of tenants have been renting for 10 years. So Trev, I know that we've got some questions coming in. So um, if you'd like to just have a quick look at that. Yeah, Lynn, I've got a couple of questions. I actually noticed also somebody said they can't hear us. I wasn't sure if that was... No, can't all hear good. Me. It's all good? <clears throat> okay. So question here, Lynn. RTA has been very helpful. It's a long question. Uh, RTA has been very helpful when you phone them. There's a person on the other end of the phone. Can you share with me what are the main... Oh, so what are the main uh, topics uh, that RTA receives with that? What are the most common questions? Sure. About half the calls the RTA receives at the uh, in our call centre are actually bond related. So, where's, how do I get a bond refund? Um, or where's is there a bond dispute and so forth? So, about half of them are bond related. The rest of them are tenancy matters, and usually the top ones are in relation to repairs and maintenance. Um, the end of a tenancy or how the process might be to end a tenancy. And that also actually includes a topical one um, around lease breaks where people are leaving their agreements early. Um, entry issues and also rent arrears. So um, there's another question here about lodging of bonds online. I think, have you answered that already? I kind of have, but I suppose at the end of the day, you can actually lodge on the forms online. Just make sure that when you're scanning and uploading your images that they are clear images. Um, and make sure that you complete all the fields appropriately. If you do lodge a bond online, you'll get a BPAY reference um, within a few days and you just need to use that reference to make sure that you pay the bond in time. So, Lynn, I've been out of residential tenancies as an operator for some time. This is all space age stuff for me. So are you saying that, and, and please forgive me, those people who dialed in who know how to do this, but question for me, 
are you saying that I don't need to go anywhere and deposit a cheque or I can just transfer funds out of my bank account into the RTA bank account? Yeah, so what we'll do, you can still send a, tra uh, a cheque from your trust account, right. that's fine. Yeah. However, you can actually um, go online, the RTA's website, right. um, go in where it says lodgements and refunds and fill in the fields and actually upload a scanned copy of the lodgement form the RTA will then send you out a BPAY reference number and you use that reference number to pay the bond. Okay. And that will come through. It's not a necessary direct link, I suppose, between your trust account and our account. It's actually a BPAY process right. that's available so at this point. So you don't need BPAY. It's not a problem. Mm. So the law states you have 14 days to lodge bonds. 10 days. 10 days. 10 days. So thank you for that. It was a trick question <laughs> and you answered it correctly. Um, so why would it, why would people take need to take longer than ten days using that process? They could do it almost almost do it daily, couldn't they? Uh, they could, Trevor, and that's a really good question. You can lodge, you can disperse bonds as soon as you actually receive them, and that's fine. What we have seen in the um, agent and manager world is that some people are lodging only at the end of the month or some people are dispersing their bonds mid and end of month. And if you do that, you may not necessarily be complying with the legislation. So that's why we know that if you choose one day a week, um, there's a good chance that you know, you're going to make that 10-day time frame that's required. Okay. All right. Thanks, Lynn. Okay. Well, just keep going. And thank you for your questions. So in relation to the lessor's obligations under the Residential Tenancies Act, and now I'm just going to go through the next part about talking about key areas of the legislation to help you as part of your business and understanding the laws. The lessor's obligation is that they must ensure the premises are cleaned, fit for the tenant to live in, good repair and not in breach of any health or safety laws. While the tenancy continues, they must maintain the premises and inclusions in good repair. And this is a very good um, section to use when you're dealing with a landlord who may not necessarily want to be doing repairs. Um, we recommend dealing with repairs in a timely manner or a reasonable time frame. If there's going to be delays in getting something fixed, again, communicate that with the tenant, make sure that they're aware that things are actually being addressed and not being um, kept in the dark in that regard. Noise issues, and Trevor, tell me if I'm right with this, that there's always four Ps, parties, pets, parkings and personalities, or is it more than four? Passive smoking. So that's five Ps. Mm -hmm. So one of the Ps would be in relation to the Ps that for parties, and that would be the noise issues that we have. So under section 184 B and C, the tenant must not cause a nuisance by the use of the premises or interfere with reasonable peace, comfort or privacy of a neighbour. So this is where you're, if someone is a, um, having parties or loud music, this is a section where they would be breaching. The condition of the property is that the tenant must keep the premises and inclusions clean, having regard to the condition at the start of the tenancy. That's one part of section 188. It then continues on to the end part where it says at the end of the tenancy, the tenant must leave the premises and inclusions as far as possible in the same condition they were in at the start of the tenancy, fair wear and tear accepted. And this is a situation where you might find tenants come to you at the end of the tenancy and say to you, oh, but, you know, Trevor, I left it in better condition than what it was when I moved in. And that's quite a common thing that we actually also hear at the RTA in our call centre and in our dispute area as well. So it's really important that you have a thoroughly completed entry condition report and an exit condition report, and we recommend also taking photos. Um, because let's face it, if this matter progresses and it comes through dispute resolution, it's not resolved and it goes off to the tribunal, you're trying to claim some cleaning or some repairs for damages, you need to have all that evidence. And how you do that is that documentation and those photos. So again, really, really important section of the Act. Um, and again, those reports to be completed and those photos. With body corporate bylaws, they do form part of the tenancy agreement. And um, on the tenancy agreement, you'll see under item 16, are there any body corporate bylaws applicable? And also, has the tenant been given a copy of the relevant bylaws? So section 69 of the Act says that the lessor lessor's agent must give a copy of the relevant bylaws. Um, and the tenant needs to actually comply with those bylaws as they do form part of the tenancy agreement.
just want to quickly touch on the rules of entry and this is an area that um, people need to comply with because they do actually have penalty provisions attached. So under sections 192 to 201 outlines the lessor's right of entry. It actually gives you the reasons for entry. So it may be to do a routine inspection. For general tenancies, you'd have to give seven days notice to the tenant. Uh, for repairs and maintenance, to show a prospective purchaser through or prospective tenant through, or to check if maintenance has been already carried out. Um, all these require 24 hours notice to the tenant. You need to issue a Form 9 entry notice. The purpose of this is to inform the tenant who is coming in um, and what day and date and time that that person is um, coming in to enter the property. If it is an emergency um, or there's a suspect that you know, by not entering um, that the damage would actually occur to the property, then you can enter without actually the 24-hour notice. You can enter straight away. Obviously, communication is key. Um, in relation to entering a property. If you are to enter for a routine inspection and you have a tenant that might say to you, no, you cannot come in, then it may be a case of asking a series of questions as to why. If you have followed the rules um, and issued the correct notice and complied with the legislation, you are entitled to enter. However, if you do have a tenant standing there saying you cannot come in, um, it may be because they have a, a sick person inside or that they might need to re-negotiate um, another date or time. So again, um, going down that path of actually communicating with the tenant um, is ideal. But as I said, if you have followed the rules, then you have you do actually have a right to enter. If you can't get into a property because the tenant is continually refusing you, you can actually apply to our dispute resolution service for assistance. Just on the, quickly on the compliance side of um, entry, under section 202, it does state that unlawful entry of premises, that you cannot contravene the rules of entry. Um, and if you do, there's a penalty unit of 120. So Trevor, I think we've got a couple more questions. Yeah, uh, look, a lot of these um, questions coming through today are very familiar to ARAMA. We get a lot of questions about Airbnb, for example, ah. and subletting. So what, what are the rules regarding subletting, Lynn? Sure. Um, in a nutshell, the lessor <coughs> does have to give written permission to allow a tenant to sublet. Um, they also do have to have good reasons to refuse that. But it is actually part of the standard terms of the tenancy agreement that the tenant does sign that they, if they are looking to sublet, that they do need the landlord's written permission to do so. So a uh, tenant can't just rent out a bedroom, whether they list it on Airbnb or not, without the written permission of the landlord or the landlord's agent? Correct, yeah. okay. yes. And it is actually a term, as I said, in their standard terms of that they've actually signed. If they do rent out a room, um, they then take on the role as a head tenant as well. Mm. So there's rules around that. We actually read a case in New Zealand where a tenant who sublet without authority was ordered by the courts to repay all of the commissions that they had gained uh, right. while they were subletting. So, um, And there was a case in the Supreme Court of Victoria that ruled in favour of the landlord uh, where the tenant insisted that they had a right to sublet through Airbnb. So clearly without written authorization from the agent uh, or the land or the landlord or the landlord's mm. agent, uh, subletting is not, they can't okay. Airbnb. Tenants can't Airbnb. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, another quick question about water charging, um, which comes up all the time. We've got a section on the ARAMA website as well on water charging. So what can, can't you charge a tenant? Okay, so you can charge water consumption. However, the Act states that the property has to be individually metered. It does have to be water efficient. And also that the agreement does state, the tenancy agreement does state that the tenant will pay for water consumption. It is the consumption part only. It is not all the services charges. Um, if it's not water, uh, if it's not individually metered, um, that's where probably a lot of the complexes may have some issues. If it's not individually metered, then they cannot be charging. Um, it's going to be a landlord to actually be covering those sort of costs. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I've got another. Uh, you want me to do some more? Yes. Just a couple more. Yes. Up there. Just 
so when a tenant breaches a bylaw, I know you covered bylaws before, but does the body corporate get involved? What's the, so what involvement does the body corporate have in terms of a bylaw breach for a tenant? Sure. Um, if a tenant has breached the agreement, um, breached a bylaw, then they breach their tenancy agreement and you can follow the Form 11 notice to remedy breach process. That's available to you under our laws. A contravention notice is not with the RTA, but it is under the Body Corporate and Community Management Act. Um, so rules would apply there. I would believe that it's not necessarily the on-site manager that's actually issuing those contravention notices, it's body corporate manager that would actually be involved in doing that. Um, I suppose, I'm not sure the time frames that that may be a little bit longer process. However, you do actually have the RTA's process that if they do breach um, a bylaw, say hypothetically here, um, it's noise issues. Um, and um, then you can actually give them seven days to rectify the breach under our laws. Okay, so let me ch just put that into plain speak. A breach, <laughs> a breach of the, sorry, I didn't mean it like that. A <laughs> breach of the bylaws yep. is a breach of the tenancy agreement. Correct. Okay, so you as an agent for a landlord can affect a breach of the tenancy agreement because they breached the bylaw, and that bylaw breach might have been repeatedly parking in visitors' parking spaces or smoking mm. yes. in areas where you're not meant to smoke. Yeah, uh, partying by the pool. It's not a question that's popped up here yet, um, but uh, smoking, uh, can you restrict smoking in a tenancy? Yes, so um, I know that special terms is something that um, always pops up. Um, you could actually to, um, put a special term in in relation to smoking outside the unit and outside the lot and everything like that. That's outside okay. The lot? Outside your unit. Oh, you mean requiring them to smoke, yes, outside. smoke outside? So restricting smoking restricting. From inside. Because under the BCCM Act, it's you can't restrict smoking in the common area under the current laws. But under the Tenancy Act, you can. If you are putting that as a special term and, and there's nothing saying that you couldn't put that they can't smoke inside yeah. the lot, yeah. uh, inside the unit, um, you could still put something like that in. Okay, so if you want to stop smoking inside the lot, you need the approval of your lot owner first of all, in writing, and you need to put it as a special condition. Right? Yeah. What about, um, so that's smoking, um, uh, very clear, uh, under the Act, can't ban smoking at the moment. What about pets though? Can you ban pets? Can we get rid of animals out of tenancies? <laughs> Good question, oh, By the way, I am a pet lover. I've got two fluffy white dogs, but... If you if the, if you didn't want pets in yeah. tenancy units, can you? Can you, um, you can. It is actually the landlord's right to actually um, either agree or disagree in relation to having a pet. And what you need to do is be very specific on your tenancy agreement. Um, and it's on the uh, I think it's the second page of the agreement where it says are pets allowed? Yes or no. Um, it also then further goes down and says if yes, then put the type of pet that's there. Um, again, this is a, an individual situation, whether um, the owner is allowing a pet or not. Um, but keep in mind, if you are allowing a pet, my advice would be to be very specific about not just say it's one cat or one dog, but to actually be specific about the type of um, animal that it is, right down to the fact of um, saying that it's, it's a chihuahua named Trevor. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you it's Barker's worst than it's fine. Um, so just to clear up, the whole passive smoking and um, uh, pets thing, which are two of the P's, you can, through the RT, through the Act, Residential Tenancies Remedial Accommodation Act, um, prohibit pets entirely and prohibit smoking entirely, providing that's the will of the landlord and it's advisable to put those into special conditions at the commencement of a lease. Yeah, and as I said, there is a part for pets on the lease whether pets are approved or not, so that easily gets um, that part solved. Um, in relation to the smoking, you can put a special term in. As with all special terms, just make sure that it doesn't contravene, uh, contravene the Residential Tenancies Act. Okay. So, um, and I know that there's always more questions coming in about special terms, which we will um, get to shortly. Um, so, 
um, we'll get that. So I'll just keep going for a moment in relation to resolving disputes. I know that we've got a question, uh, thank you, in relation to water. So again, it really comes down to it must be individually metered um, and that you must also make sure that um, the tenancy agreement states that the um, person does pay the water on the agreement. Okay, so I'll just go and start talking about resolving disputes. Um, we start as a, like a three-step process. So the first part is self-resolution. We want you to communicate. You're actually, as managers of being on-site managers, um, you are living on-site. You're probably building relationships and, and can communicate quite easily with the tenants that you have on-site. So we ask that you talk, communicate, share evidence, stick to the facts um, and negotiate if need be. So try and all those skills to actually try and resolve the matter yourselves. If, it's, if you cannot resolve it, the next step is uh, dispute resolution and I'll talk about our dispute process shortly. And then again, if it's still not resolved, your next option is to go to the tribunal, which is QCAT, Queensland Civil and Administration Tribunal. There's urgent and non-urgent matters under the Act. So if it's an urgent matter, usually that is if you're probably trying to end a tenancy, um, seeking a termination order, a warrant of possession, or anything outlined under Section 415 of the Act, then it's a straight go to QK. You don't need to come through dispute resolution. Any other matter, and it's usually um, either bond or money related matters or to get something fixed, can actually come through our dispute resolution first. It's a non-urgent matter before progressing off to the tribunal. So the types of common disputes we receive, um, about half of our disputes in last financial year, the RTI received about 27,000 disputes. Um, half of them are about bond matters, so where someone is actually disputing um, a bond claim. Uh, we also have compensation, so excess of the bond amount. So you're claiming the bond plus you're looking for more money and need to get that notice of unresolved dispute to go off to the tribunal. Uh, Non-lodgement of bond. So again, this is an offence under the Act, but sometimes we are receiving disputes where the bond has not actually reached the RTA. That would also go into our investigations area, but the people, would also, the tenant would also have to go through disputes um, to get a notice to actually proceed, the, um, proceed to the tribunal. Repairs and maintenance, ending a tenancy, rent arrears and entry. It's interesting, a lot of the disputes that we receive are very also very similar to the types of inquiries we receive at the RTA as well. So when you come through the RTA, the first thing we will do is an intake process to check the dispute resolution form and assess it. If it is suitable to go through to a telephone conference, we will then um, make that decision and book in a time for you. If the matter is unsuitable, and a lot of times we find that people will not participate in a telephone conference or participate in the process, um, or the matter is not um, a matter that is actually compliant with our legislation, then if that be the case, we would close that or issue a notice of unresolved dispute. We do have on our website all matters that are deemed to be unsuitable, um, and that's all listed um, as a requirement. So with the conciliation process, the first part would be that we would have a telephone conference. Um, the parties to the dispute actually own the dispute outcome. The conciliator is impartial, so they're not there to take sides nor make decisions. They may um, share information with you, making sure that each side understands what the dispute is about, um, but they're not there to take decisions, to make decisions, sorry. The outcome is actually the people who are in the dispute. So that would be potentially yourself and the tenant or yourself acting on the instructions from the owner. It is a confidential and voluntary process. So as I said before, as part of the intake, if someone does not want to participate, in the conciliation process, we can't force them to do that and that means that we would actually have to close down the file. But as I said, it is voluntary and we would highly encourage people to participate in our um, con uh, conciliation process. Uh, look, we've got um, some more questions there, Lynn. Are we running into, how are we going for time now? I think we're going good, Trevor. Okay. Let's so keep going. Fire up more questions. <laughs> Um, so the elephant in the room right now is a case uh, that was recently prosecuted through the courts uh, by the RTA uh, regarding um, special terms, and we talked about special terms a little bit mm -hmm. before. So we're starting to see cases where RTA are becoming more investigative, if that's the word. 
So yep. tell, us, tell us what's going on there. What? Okay. Yeah. So um, I will talk a little bit more on compliance in a moment. Um, however, but let's just talk about the special term. There is a couple of recent cases, um, you're correct, uh, where we have prosecuted a large agency in Brisbane and also an agency up North Queensland. And those prosecutions um, have actually involved two parts, one of special terms and the other part of unlawful entry. Uh, for members of ARAMA who are listening today or in the future, you can actually find um, those articles on our website under Newsroom and I would recommend actually having a read of those particular outcomes. Um, with special terms, the main thing is to understand that someone can actually, a party to the contract can actually draft a special term. So that's either the landlord or a tenant. Um, and it's really on making sure that if you are drafting a special term that you're not contravening outside the legislation. And under Section 53 is contracting outside the Act, you can't do. It's prohibited. So people are putting special terms in that um, are a breach of the legislation. And one of the big ones is about carpet cleaning. Um, and with carpet cleaning, all you can do is if the carpets were steam cleaned at the start, you can ask them to steam clean at the end. Put all your evidence in your entry condition report as to what that standard is, yeah, your receipts, your photos, and write on your entry condition report what that is. If you have a special term on your tenancy agreement, and I'm going to be very clear on this, if you have one that says the tenant must have the carpets professionally clean and must use ABC carpet cleaning, then you are in breach of the legislation. And where this also comes into, um, if you have a special term that says you must have the um, premises professionally cleaned at the end, you must have blinds professionally cleaned. If you have those sort of requirements where you're asking a tenant to purchase goods and services, which is a breach of Section 171, then you are breaching the legislation. Let me clear this up. If I require a tenant to professionally steam clean their carpets on completion of the lease, that's a breach of the Act. Correct. Good question, Trevor. So at the end of the day, if they were steam clean at the start, they need to be steam clean. The tenant has an obligation under Section 1884, return the property back, same condition, less fair wear and tear. How they are doing that is up to them. So if they choose to use a recommended cleaner, they choose to get someone else, or they choose to hire a machine, that's fine. The main thing is that you cannot ask them to purchase a particular service or goods and that they, how your main concern should be is that the property is left in the same condition, less fair wear and tear. Okay. Now, I know you don't write the policy, but I'm going to ask, I'm just going to challenge you with this question. Okay. So I know it's a policy question. If I say you must use my steam cleaning services as a condition of your exit, it's pretty clear that's a breach of the Act. You can't force someone to take your services. Correct. If I say you must use a recognised professional steam cleaning company in order to clean those carpets, I'm hearing that that's also a breach of the Act, and I kind of get it. But to be able to say to a tenant that these carpets have been steam cleaned prior to your entry, and here is the receipt, and here's the evidence, and they must be returned in the same condition, which ne necessitates steam cleaning, uh, then they could do it themselves as long as they can show evidence that the carpets have been steam cleaned and returned in the same condition, less fair wear and tear. Absolutely. So that's not a breach. Yeah. Okay. So I think where the main thing comes into, again, going back to return the property as the same condition, your very detailed entry condition report that's going to have that it was professionally cleaned, his evidence to say that it was, this is the standard. It's about setting that standard. And you can ask the tenant to re return the carpets in the same standard as what it was. How they do that is not really your concern. It's about making sure that condition is the same at the yeah. end. Just to continue on this, the RTA does have a video that has been uh, recently launched. It's on the RTA's website. At the end of today's recording, we will actually include that um, video and it does talk about special terms and particularly in relation to compliance and particularly in relation to carpet cleaning. Excellent. Thank you. So, great question, Trevor. And it's always, as you said, a bit of an elephant in the room at this point in time. I'm a bit conscious of time, so I'll just keep going through. Just to give a... Um, 
inform information in relation to what is a dispute versus investigation. So with dispute resolution and resolving disputes, it's a tenancy and bond dispute. It's a breach of the terms of the tenancy agreement. And as I said before, if it's not resolved through conciliation, it goes off to QCAT. And that's how you actually go through this process is completing a Form 16 dispute resolution request form. With investigations, this is actually the alleged breaches of the penalty provisions of the legislation. This is not going to QCAT, this is actually going to the Magistrates Court. And the RTA does proactive and reactive cases in relation to investigations. And to give you an idea, last financial year we did 815 um, cases of um, where people have actually complained or done a proactive, or our investigators have done a proactive case. Um, we get, um, sometimes people have rung the call centre and it may be that the bond's not lodged at the RTA, you know, they then need to obviously let us know that it wasn't lodged. They then can go through our dispute process to claim um, the money from that side through, but they also can actually do a complaint to the RTA because there was a breach of the Act. We can also get referrals from Office of Fair Trading. So that is actually the uh, government body that deals with the Property Occupations Act, which you would actually be complying with, um, and all the trust accounting um, processes as well. Queensland Police Service and also Queensland Fire and Emergency Services as well. So I understand for this financial year, um, we are actually probably up about uh, 10 to 20% in relation to the amount of files that we're actually dealing with. So the common types of investigations, the non-lodgement of bond or the late lodgements. So again, if your business practice is to lodge at the end of the month or lodge mid end of the month, you may not be complying with our Act. So again, change your business practices to make sure you are dispersing the bonds more regularly to meet that 10 day time frame. Unlawful of entry, which I've actually touched on earlier. Unlawful recovery of possession. Under the legislation, um, there's seven ways how a tenancy can end. And that is uh, Form 12, a notice to leave is issued. A Form 13, notice of intention to leave. Mortgagee in possession. Um, abandonment, mutual agreement, a tribunal order, or death of a sole tenant. That's how the rules state in the legislation how a tenancy can end. Going outside those rules under Section 353, there are actually penalty provisions in place for that. Contracting outside the legislation in relation to special terms, we've just kind of had that bit of a um, conversation there, Trevor. Um, but again, as I said, please refer. We have information on our website in relation to special terms and, as I said, a video which will also play at the end of the recorded um, webinar. Photos used in advertising without written permission. You cannot use tenants' belongings, a uh, photo that contains the tenants' belongings if it actually, uh, for advertising, uh, that has penalty provisions. And also conducting an open house also has penalty provisions. Just on that last point, if they give permission, if you get a permission slip, look, I want to come in, you're leaving, I want to come in, take some photos, can you sign this little thing saying, it's okay to take photos while my stuff is here, is that okay? Absolutely. So this is actually getting that written permission from the tenant to say, yes, um, come in, I'm fine that you take the photos and that you're going to use that for advertising. As I said, it's all about the tenant's written permission for that. And not having a written agreement or entry condition report also does have penalty um, units attached to it. So just to give you an idea, the RTA investigation, a complaint, if it is substantiated, we can provide education. So they may sort of just have a conversation with you, a bit like probably the slap on the wrist, I think, Trevor. Um, I may like to issue... call it education. It doesn't have to involve capital punishment. <laughs> um, issue a warning letter. Um, and if that be the case, they may still also um, monitor things. Um, issue a penalty infringement notice is a what we call a PIN. And this is a little bit probably like a, uh, a, a speeding ticket as such. So it's a smaller amount of a penalty that could be... Um, it's a small amount in, um, like compared to what a full prosecution might be um, and that you do have, there's some rules in relation to the penalty infringement notice and we do have information on our website, particularly if you do get issued a, um, a penalty infringement notice or more importantly, if we do commence prosecution. Um, with prosecution, as I said before, if we go down that path and you have breached the penalty provisions of our legislation, um, the matter will go before a local magistrate's court. If it is a company director, they must be advised and also they must have authority to bind the company. It's really important for that. 
Um, we would recommend whether you, if you have been issued with a penalty infringement notice or if it is a prosecution that you seek your own independent legal advice. It's really important that you understand what the process is in relation to our investigations process. There is probably going to be legal costs and as I said, if you read the latest articles that we have in our newsroom on the RTA website, you'll see the recent cases in relation to two real estate agents that we have recently prosecuted. So we have a lot of information on our website. Um, so it's rta.qld.gov.au. And again, if you have an urgent question that you need answering, um, either today or in the future, please contact our 1300 366 311 number or again you have access to Trevor at Arama as well. For what it's worth, yeah. No. Are we done? I think we're nearly done Trevor, I think you've got some more questions. Well I, look I brought some questions which are frequently asked of us but we've, we've done all of the um, online questions uh, so I just want to let people know that we have recorded this webinar, we will be sending out a wrap-up to you and we'll also be, and, and a survey to you asking what you thought of this auspicious occasion of uh, uh, webinars to members. Um, but we'll also have this webinar online on our ARAMA website under online re education resources. Uh, and Lynn, you're going to connect the link to the video that explains special conditions? Absolutely. We will actually, um, I don't actually have the technical skills, sure. Trevor, however, but we will have someone here that has those skills embed the, web and, um, okay. the video about special terms in amongst this um, recording for you. Yeah. So, um, so we'll have those links available. It'll be on the website. If you have a question in the future, you can uh, ring the, the 1300 number, I, I, uh, the R, uh, RTA 1300 number, or uh, that previous slide, yep, those numbers, or the website address, uh, very helpful people in here at RTA, or you can give a RAM a call or, or an email and we'll flip the question on to the RTA, um, or you can jump onto the ARAMA discussion forum, you can, the member help member discussion forum is also helpful. So there's a number of ways in which you can get your questions answered. And that really uh, is what we've done today. We've tried to interspice some questions with your presentation, which has um, made it very interesting, Lynn. I only nodded off once or twice, you probably didn't notice. A power napper. <laughs> um, so uh, look, I think uh, we've, we've, there's no other questions that popped up, but if you do have a question, there's plenty of ways to ask them. Lynn, I'd like to thank you for your presentation. I want to thank everybody who's uh, who has dialed in for dialing in and not nodding off. We can tell. And um, I, I want to encourage you to tell your friends that ARAMA is in the webinar business and that the next time uh, we've got them out there, you can, you can tell them whether you had a, a good experience and and also tell us whether you've had a good experience with this webinar when we send you a survey. So uh, that's uh, all from me. Okay, great. Well, thank you, Trevor. And thank you everyone again for attending today's session. Um, as I said, a copy of the recording and also the video in relation to special terms will actually be available for Arama. Um, so we take the opportunity again. Thank you, Trevor, for coming in. And again, uh, we look forward to working with you in the future in relation to doing more webinars and coming into the digital age. Again, this webinar will now end. Thank you very much for your time, everybody. Lee is a property manager for a Queensland real estate agency. Lee's company is firm but fair to protect the interests of all parties to a tenancy. Property owners readily use Lee's company because they have an established reputation for complying with legislation and working with tenants to resolve issues wherever possible. After seeing a recent court outcome in the media, Lee phoned the RTA to discuss the tenancy agreement that the agency had been using. Their version includes additional terms to the tenancy agreement, which are sometimes called special terms. Lee was advised by the RTA that some of the special terms could be unlawful because they required the tenant to purchase professional goods or services. If a special term states that a tenant must provide a receipt or engage a professional, it is a breach of Section 171 of the Act.
This means that these special terms placed an additional burden on the tenant which was already provided for in the Act, or sought to evade the obligations of the landlord or agent under the Act. Lee was shocked and concerned that the agency might be breaking the law and asked the RTA what would happen. The RTA advised that if a penalty infringement notice was issued, there could be a penalty of $1,200 or more for the agency, while an individual could receive a penalty of more than $250. If the matter was prosecuted in the magistrate's court, the penalty for the agency could be more than $12,000 and up to $2,500 for an individual. There were over 200 tenancy agreements in place with these special terms included and Lee did not want to receive a penalty infringement notice or defend a prosecution in the magistrate's court. Lee asked the RTA what should be done. The RTA advised Lee that if the property owner or the managing agency took reasonable steps to remedy the situation, the likelihood of the RTA taking enforcement action would be reduced. Lee could issue a written statement removing the unlawful terms in the existing tenancy agreements, or notify tenants in writing that the special terms would no longer apply, effective immediately. Immediately after getting advice from the RTA, Lee's agency amended the tenancy agreement by removing any unlawful terms. The agency also added information to their vacate packs, reminding tenants of Section 188 of the Act, which states, Tenants must leave the premises and inclusions as far as possible in the same condition they were in at the start of the tenancy, fair wear and tear accepted. At the start of each tenancy, Lee and the tenants complete an entry condition report and attach photos to record the standard and condition of the rental property. Then, at the end of the tenancy, an exit condition report is completed with more photos when the tenants vacate. This helps to protect both the tenant and Lee to avoid disagreements and disputes about the condition of the property when the tenants leave. Importantly, Lee learned that the way in which that same condition, less fair wear and tear, is achieved at the end of the tenancy is entirely up to the tenant. That means that while Lee's agency can provide a list of companies to assist tenants to return carpets and other items to the same standard, tenants will not be obliged to use these companies. One year later, a tenant made a complaint to the RTA about unlawful terms provided in the tenancy agreement by Lee's agency. The RTA investigated the matter and sent a letter to Lee asking for a response to the allegations. The RTA was provided with evidence that proved the agency had written to tenants to advise that the terms were unlawful and would not be enforced, reminded tenants of their obligations under the Act when they provided notice to vacate the property, advised the tenant in question that the terms would not be enforced, and had not made a bond claim on these grounds. The RTA decided that the case would not be progressed. The tenant was advised that no penalty or prosecution would be pursued. For more information on special terms, RTA investigations, entry and exit condition reports, please contact the RTA on 1300 366 311 or visit rta.qld.gov.au.